Good afternoon, and thank you for coming. Um, last Sunday, somebody from the general audience, after our session was over, came over to me and said, she didn't know that tapestry hung from the left direction. And she said, does it cause any trouble? <laughs> and that's what um, my next, our next session starts, where she asked the questions, because we discussed, we had discussed washing tapestries, conserved tapestries, and now it's a third steps. Um, this session's topic is support system and the different ways of exhibiting historic tapestries. Because of that tapestry's characteristic uh, structure, this is a very important subject. So uh, today's three speakers collectively uh, represent the impressive breadth of experience with this subject. All three have been and are responsible for the preservation of important major tapestry collection, both in the United States and in Europe. We will hear accounts of different approaches to support tapestry effectively and safely, and different opinions on how to best display tapestries on exhibit. And I noticed that this subject has been always discussed um, intensively and not always uh, unanimously agreed upon. So I'm hoping that uh, discussion will come out and we will uh, welcome questions from the audience also. Our first speaker, Patricia Ruwer is an internationally known and respected scholar and conservator who had her training in many of the New York Metropolitan Area Conservation Lab, it's including Metropolitan Museum of Art. Her career took her across the United States and overseas to Florence, Italy, Glasgow, Scotland, and Surrey, England. Uh, in the past 10 years, she released numerous publications and on, on the various subject of her expertise, organized countless lectures and workshops in the United, Nation, United States and also outside the United States, goes all over the world, and was uh, honored with many awards. Ms. Ewers is uh, presently the principal of the Textile Objects Conservation in Mound, Minnesota. Ms. Ewers will present a paper co-authored with Beth McLaurin, a senior conservator at the Midwest Arts Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The title of their paper is Support System, Observation on Two Methods strapping and solid support. Please welcome Ms. Ewer. Thank you, Madhuri. Thank you, Florica, and thank you, Tina. That was such a nice introduction. <laughs> um, Tina asked me to discuss this topic because of my experience on both sides of the Atlantic, AKA the pond. I asked Beth McLaughlin to co-author with me as we worked together at Biltmore House for many years. Beth is really sorry she couldn't be here today. She has a three-year-old boy. <laughs> the support system topic is supposed to be highly controversial. Both camps wedded to their beliefs. After many years, limited pub published references on the nuances of support procedures, it's still not clear who or which is right. Beth and I are adding our personal observation as, observations as well as a number of colleagues we interviewed to this debate as we don't feel that as of yet we have much actual scientific proof of any system. Experiments are in the works, which may or may not prove anything beyond controlled situations as experiments go. Um, but hopefully the work being done will add some information to our body of knowledge so we can make you know, more informed choices in the future. 
20 minutes is an incredibly short time to discuss this vast topic. We cannot even begin to survey the tapestry conservation literature, of which now there's a sizable amount. I will mention a few texts and um, specific to this topic that we've referenced. If you would like our complete bibliography, we can send it to you. We've got our email addresses at the end of the talk. Uh, a tapestry is an inherently weak object like you've heard the last few days. The tra traditional transverse hang means that the wefts carry more weight than the stronger and more cohesive warps. Discontinuous weft weaving te techniques exacerbate the weak directional hanging issues and can create additional weight distribution problems. Reasons why we're concerned with tapestry supports. The overall size of the pieces, original materials, age and degradation of the tapestry, display type and location, permanent versus rotating display, large slits including applied borders um, and applied galloons, large areas of weak silk, weft loss, warp and or weft loss, inconsistent weaving tension, uneven tensions from weaving methods, multiple color changes versus versus large areas of the same color, poorly executed previous repairs, alterations, or lack thereof, patches, and I mentioned degradation again. Degradation is really important. These pieces are really old. What are we trying to support? What's the definition? This whole concept goes beyond tapestries. It bleeds over into all historic textiles that need to be supported for display and or preservation needs. Other support systems or examples include sandwich mounts, solid support mounts, or custom support on mannequins, like many of the um, different types of support and uh, mounts we saw yesterday in the conservation lab. What circumstances make one method prefer preferable to another? Is there a formula to calculate this preference? To what degree do we want to intervene? In a discipline where systematic collection and analysis of analysis of scientific evidence is still rare. The whys, what ifs, and witches will continue be, to be asked for a very long time, especially this afternoon. While most conservators believe they choose treatments based on the requirements of the item being conserved, for this aspect of tapestry conservation, we may lack the proof of our convictions. Often the choice may be one of training or laboratory tradition. This topic was addressed in the um, wonderful book by Camille myers Brees, um, uh, her 2000 survey of American tapestry conservation techniques. And I had this really nice image of some of the, um, an older backing strapping technique, and I was really, really um, pleased to hear the, uh, Ksenia earlier this morning talk about trying to conserve a historic backing lining a 16th century tapestry they had for the National Trust. Where do modern support backing ideas come from? Breeze mentions a Swedish strapping method that may have filtered down to the um, Nobuko Kajitani, whose adaptation of that method is still being used at the Metropolitan Museum of Art today, which we saw in the last few days. The full backing support method in the United Kingdom came about from the work of Daniel Bosworth and Karen Finch in the 1960s, as Bos Bosworth stated in the Leonard Haywood book on tapestry conservation. These are two popular methods, and you know, I'm going to focus on these two. The full support system, um, uh, and in addition to Bosworth and Finch, I mean, Leonard and Marcus and Shepard have written descriptions of this technique, but there's still uh, limited diagramming or Im imagery, especially uh, of the back of these systems, um, in any of the literature. You kind of have to see it being done to understand it, or maybe we need to make videos on YouTube or something. I don't know. Um, I'm not an expert at this technique, and I'll try to describe it as best I can, but there's a lot of people here that do it and that can probably explain it a lot better, or there are variations thereof. This is, of course, again, Hampton Court, the um, textile conservation rooms there. The tapestry is wound around the tubes here, the linen is in the middle and comes forth underneath the tapestry and then is pinned and marked in place. And there's 15 centimeter um, uh, stitching to support that backing on the back, uh, kind of a runny stitch that holds that in place. And then the repair work is done through that backing. 
This is another close-up of that. So you see the, the line that it holds the, the direction and the support of the linen on the back, a lot of um, pins to hold it in place and areas where they're doing the stitching. And of course, there's a number of tapestries throughout Hampton Court Palace on the other palaces that have been done with this t technique, not every one of them, two or now I think there's three in the Great Hall that have been done that way. And they hang beautifully and they all look really good. The strapping support system is equally difficult to envision. Um, Kajitani, Bruce Hutchison in the 1989 uh, Getty publication describe it. Kathy Francis describes it in the Leonard and um, Hayward book. They've given, again, really good written descriptions, but again, little imagery. This technique I'm a little more familiar with and I was able to get a lot of pictures uh, from my colleagues. This diagram I'd made a few years ago, and I have repeated it again for um, use by the LA County Museum of Art. Catherine McLean had a question about um, a tapestry she needed to support rather quickly. So the strapping technique, um, the straps are every 12, 15, or 18 inches apart. They originally, many, many years ago in the late 70s and early 80s, we had kind of a narrow inch and a half heavy woven webbing that we used. Um, then on top of the straps, at the bottom there was always a footer, kind of a dust footer that was just uh, stitched for um, across the bottom and that was, you know, just to catch dust. What I've added more recently is this header, which I'll talk about, because it seems to be many of the tapestries that I've been working on were so weak at the top from former hanging devices or being nailed to the wall or tacked to the wall or the stress and strain from the old ring system that they used to have. And then on top of that, you'd have the Velcro support, and then there'd be a whole separate dust cover lining. I found this when I was going through all my records. Bruce Hutchinson had this very elaborate formula for how to calculate the straps, and I thought it was kind of fun to see this again. The tapestry, again, this is from the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. This is one of the tapestries that was done in um, the late 70s, early 80s by me and Mary Ann Butterfield, and you can see the straps. It's, it's those narrow um, webbing ones again, and Beth was preparing this tapestry actually to come to the Baroque exhibition. So she was adding the top header that we like so much now. So that, that's the header. Hello. I guess my little... This is the header, and she's got kind of a network grid, um, diamond pattern stitches to support that. Um, going from strap to strap. We try to make this header uh, go down below any type of border, three or four inches, so it goes into the body of the tapestry a little bit. Just some other views. She's starting to bring this up on the hoist here. I'm pretty sure she stitched that. Yeah, she did stitch it vertically. Once it was pinned in place, she raises it up on the, um, the, the hoist, and then they do the stitching front to back people on each side. Now these are the tapestries we did at Biltmore House. After I knew I was coming to do this talk, I was in North Carolina on business and I went over to the Biltmore House um, to take a look at these tapestries that we had done the strapping technique to back in, um, you know, 20 years ago. So these are um, three, four of the ones we had completed and the silk areas, I looked very carefully. Nothing's drooping, nothing's sagging in between. I was able to get this shot of this tapestry in raking light, and you can see I was fearing, I was looking for festooning, I was looking for distortion, and still after 20 years, they hang really flat, and that was one of the first ones that was done. This is another technique that Beth had to do because the size of this tapestry to fit in this narrow space originally um, in the 1890s had been folded and stitched back and she didn't really want to do that again. So she's got this nice um, sort of soft fold going on, and that looked really good. Now, I've added this piece, too, because after they closed the textile conservation department at Biltmore, there was one tapestry left, and they sent it to the Cathedral St. John the Divine. So Marlene and her staff had done this last one. And again, everything looks really fine. Everything's still hanging flat. Nothing's distorting. Um, 
I want to make a comment here about when I was talking earlier about images and directions and um, uh, the full backing support technique or the strapping technique, Francis and I found when we were writing our book that it's really limited literature that we have about the actual sticking, stitching and placement and mounting of textiles that we do every day. And I don't know if we're so bored with it and we don't want to publish it, but we really would like to encourage people to consider writing on those topics. They seem really basic, but we need to get these things out there and recorded, the kind of work that we do every day. Harold Mylan, uh, I talked to him too, and he sent me these wonderful pictures. Now, so you can see the variance of what's going on here. Um, I forgot to mention on the Biltmore pieces that we had got, uh, gotten away from the narrow inch and a half heavy webbing straps. What I ended up using there was a softer three inch wide twill tape. Now you can see Bruce is getting even wider. I think his straps are about six inches, very soft fabric. Um, he's got a footer at the bottom of his tapestries, too. And independently, without any discussion, he, too, is now doing this header piece. And he gave me some ideas of some of the patching that goes on behind his tapestries in weak areas, too. And that's his finished tapestry. Now the header I was talking about, this is the tapestry at La LA County Museum that Catherine needed to put up. It was already strapped, and I think they are kind of, if you can see them down here, they are the old system of six inch wide lim linen straps, but she was just nervous about hanging this very fragile tapestry, and we discussed it, and I recommended she do this header. And she did such a nice um, description of it, and because we were kind of going back and forth, email and photographs, she was trying to make sure she was doing it right. So um, these are really, really great slides that she made. And can you see the tapestry here, laid out where they're doing the header on the table? And that's the tapestry after it's finished. Now, I, sort of, I tried to put all this information from both methods into a table. Um, and I don't mean anything by having them on parallel lines. It's just like the kind of things we think about, the risks and the benefits of, the, of each system. Um, everything's kind of a compromise, like I think Cassini said earlier, too. You just have to decide which is going to be best for your situation. Now there's, of course, different solutions just besides the full support or the straps, or there's variations on each system. You can have limited patching or backing of large silk areas. I've done that in the past. You can have combinations of straps and or partial or full supports. Um, like I said, the straps can be thin. It seems like a lot of us are getting um, wider and wider with our straps, so we're almost going to full support. Um, another method, um, or the, the solid supports, um, the, like we saw at the cloisters yesterday morning, um, I really kind of like the whole idea of that too. People mentioned the first day they didn't want to really restrict um, tapestries. They thought it was stressful for things being held taut. But I kind of like the idea of using the stronger warps when you can. Yeah. I had... In, when I was digging through all my stuff, too, for this talk, I found this old sketch I'd made back in 1987, where at that point I'd been recording the different types of backing and support systems that I'd seen, and then I found a picture of one of these that's much like one of the sketches I had, and then this is just a different type of stitching the backing into place, the full support backing into place. What I'd done, this is a tapestry we did at Biltmore, because besides Biltmore, um, Biltmore's collection. We had a, a, a full-service conservation lab. We worked for museums all over the country at that point. And Sarah Ryder asked us to do this tapestry, the FETs, for them. Um, it was really, really long. Um, we even had to rebuild kind of our hoist system for this piece. I think it's like 24, 25 feet. Huge, weak silk area again. We did the support um, stitching the repair work on the actual warps themselves. 
did a dust cover lining and straps. But what I added on these pieces were Velcro on the two sides. So there could be some tension on those warps to hold it into place. And I asked Sarah again, and this tapestry was up for almost two years, and she said it hung very, very well for those two years. So um, how do we decide to do what we do? The greatest source of information for any of us comes from looking at the tapestries themselves, and as many as we possibly can. That opportunity has been presented here at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the hanging of Tom Campbell's two tapestry exhibitions, Tapestry in the Renaissance, Art and Magnificence in 2002. They had 41 tapestries dating from 1450 to 1560. I mean, these 41 tapestries were from 33 collections in 12 different countries, so you know they almost have had some type of different backing. And then the other more recent exhibition, Tapestry in the Baroque, Threads of Splendor, that was in 2007, that had another 40 tapestries dating from 1590 to 1720, uh, collections again from diff 15 different countries. If only, I love those exhibitions, but if only we could have seen the backs of the pieces, that's all I could think about going through the two shows. We all agree that much depends on tapestry's age, early or late, variations in the weave structure, including density, the amount and types of slits, materials such as silk, percent of silk, the drop factor, and the tapestry's overall condition. I don't think most of us are trying to be formulaic, and we're trying to provide treatments tailored to our specific tapestries. Boswell stated in Leonard's tapestry book, when a full she, she stated, when a full support is required, and I took that to mean that maybe she doesn't always do full supports on all her tapestries. Harold Milan, Camille Myers-Breeze, and Marlene Eidelheit were more than happy to describe their decisions for using straps, but all of them seemed flexible and had varied the techniques over the years. Several US conservators do use full backing, so it's not an international divide. I think the most difficult part is doing repair work through the support. I personally believe that. It's a concept that's a little bit difficult for me. And if tapestries are much more fragile than we thought, as proven by the monitoring of damaged in historic tapestry study, the MODHT, this is outlined in the recent publication, Wrought in Gold and Silk, Preserving the Art of Historic Tapestries, which Mariah Hack is going to talk about later this afternoon. Beth and I personally feel that um, so much pinning, stitching, moving, and handling um, to get different types of backings on is, is not a great way to go. Um, I would prefer to repair and then add a backing. And again, I have to say, this is merely based on observation and experience, no hard scientific facts. But that's not to say we haven't got some great scientific studies going on. Um, Bilson, Howell, Cook, and Cook in their article, Mechanical Aspects of Lining Loose Hung Textiles in 1997 was a great study that was published in, that was one of the first NATCCs. If only that study could have been continued. It was just like it kind of left you hanging. It was such great information at the time. Today we finally have people addressing these hanging questions in a more scientific manner. While the MODHT was chem is chemical-based research that concentrated on fiber and dye analysis and their degradation, we now have several engineering studies based on the physical aspects of the objects, and these have just come forth, all of which Frances Leonard are, has been involved in, and she mentioned in her keynote address. Working with the School of Engineering at the University of Southampton, Hampton, they are trying to develop a non-destructive testing method for measuring stress-strain relationships in hanging tapestries. Next. I, too, was fortunate to be part of a study with my colleagues at Historic Royal Palaces. We all produced a paper titled Tapestry Conservation Traditions, an Analysis of Support Techniques for Large Hanging Textiles. In that paper, Carrie Osari, who was the lead, Catherine Hallett, our conservation scientist, Emma Biggs, now Henny, uh, was a tapestry conservation supervisor, and I attempted to set up a model that others could use to study the effectiveness of different structural support methodologies used for large-scale hangings. Um, I think we can argue that there are more than two ways to support a tapestry. 
That's Kari, and that's just two of the samples that she was using. Um, uh, she had many more in that study. Um, again, I think we can argue that there are more than two ways to support a tapestry. If anyone thinks there's a sim single formula, I kind of feel they're mistaken. As we've demonstrated, there are other possibilities besides strapping or a full support backing or variations on those themes. Again, first and foremost is the condition of the tapestry that needs to be addressed. What type of support does it warrant? Where is it going to go once it's conserved? A complete environmentally controlled museum or a historic house with no controls or a future museum? We still have questions to ask. Are we supporting the tapestry, restricting its movement, allowing its movement, um, for example, during great humidity swings? And what backing or strapping materials are better, linen or cotton? Constant debate. And Mary Ballard and Frances Hartog has done, have done articles on those topics. What about the length of time it takes to repair tapestries? Eight years, 10 years, 14 years? That was with volunteers in Minneapolis, but it was 14 years. What are the climatic changes during those years? And what about green initiatives or energy consumption in our buildings? How can you know this when you start out? Conservation standards constantly change, too. I think in Minneapolis, they went from conservation stitching to restoration and back to conservation again. So it's sort of what is the mood of the day that um, affects our conservation work. I want to remind every, everyone, too, that some of the most abuse an object gets is in the conservation lab. Um, when you talk about many, many, many years of conservation work, you have to take into account that lighting, that handling, that stitching, that moving. And um, that, there can be a lot that goes on to a piece over that time. Um, in some concluding remarks, I have strapped, patched, fully backed tapestries. It de depends on the piece and its conditions. I have not stitched repairs to backings. I'm not saying that that cannot or should not be done in extreme cases. Camille Myers Brooks in her book states, the most surprising fact about straps to emerge from her study is that very few American conservators always strap. It seems, then, that strapping, which has for so long defined American tapestry conservators in the eyes of our European counterparts, is always under investigation. And I like this final statement of hers. We, American tapestry conservators, although possessing a wide array of techniques and preferences, have many goals in common. And I have to add, I'm sure our international colleagues do, too. As professionals, we all seek to provide stable repairs and that respect the history, history of the tapestry and the needs of the viewer. And I have to add, too, now we have the stakeholders we have to address. We strive to expand our, our knowledge and improve our methods. Which brings me to why the symposium is so important. I'm really glad we can all be here and share, and I hope we have a lively discussion later. Um, and I hope maybe that we do get these uh, papers published in the future. Um, Beth and I would like to make a final challenge to everybody here. Um, we would like you to invite you to study and experiment with the different systems and share those experiences with us. Take a look at the system we developed at Historic Royal Palaces or look at one of Francis Leonard's um, engineering studies. Go to work with an engineering department. Um, try something and perhaps we can share our findings someday all together. We must be careful, I want to caution you too, as we're such a small field, we end up doing our own research and our, our own experimentation. And that sometimes can instill our own bias in, in the experiments that we do. So I feel like um, that just doesn't happen in textile conservation. I think it happens in all conservation sometimes. So I feel that if a greater number of us do repeatable experiments and then share this information together, we can um, strengthen our own arguments uh, and strive for objectivity at the same time. Alice Blum um, said she observed while, the hang while hanging the tapestry of the Baroque exhibition that she saw tapestries with full backing straps partial patches, and some tapestries with nothing at all in the back. She remarked that they all hung well. Um, granted, it was a short-term exhibition, but what could we learn from those observations? I think we could learn a lot. OK, I think that's it. I just want to say there's no formula, and I think we all know that in our work, we have to make some compromises. Thank you very much. These are selected references. This is how to get a hold of Beth and I.
And I want to thank the Metropolitan for having us and the two uh, foundations, Kawasaki and the Quinque Foundation. Thank you.